Right. Uh, good afternoon, students, um, and welcome to this afternoon's uh, webinar on STEM programs in the United States. Our uh, speaker for this afternoon will be uh, Henry Oliver, who is the Communications and International Programs uh, Coordinator at um, West Virginia University. Before we begin his presentation, I'd just like to give you a short introduction to Education USA. Uh, and my name is Aparna Chandrasekharan, and I'm an advisor at Education USA. Uh, with the Center uh, U.S. India Education Foundation in Chennai. Uh, for your information, Education USA is a global network of uh, 400 advising centers in 170 countries. We are supported by the U.S. Department of State's uh, Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs. In India, uh, Education USA centers work under the umbrella of the U.S. India Education Foundation offices. We have five centers under the USIF umbrella, and these are in the cities of Delhi, Mumbai, Kolkata, Hyderabad, and Chennai. We also have two independent education USA centers in, Hyder in Bangalore and in Ahmedabad. For those of you students who may not be from uh, main metro cities, you're welcome to contact our centers in Bangalore and Ahmedabad also for information about studying in the US. Um, our mandate is to provide uh, accurate, current, and comprehensive information to students who are interested in pursuing their higher education in the U.S. And we reach out to student audiences through education fairs, outreach events in schools and universities, as well as uh, through direct interaction at our centers and through these webinars like the one we are hosting this evening. Uh, without any further delay, I would like to um, introduce our presenter for this afternoon. We have Henry Oliver from the University of West Virginia. Uh, he is the Communications and International Programs Coordinator, and he will be speaking about STEM programs. His presentation will cover information about undergraduate and graduate education. Uh, thank you all students for joining us. Uh, do hold your questions till the end of the presentation. Henry will answer them uh, after he has completed his presentation. Henry, over to you. Uh, all right. You can start your presentation. Thank you very much. Perfect. Well, thank you all for having me, and thank you all for attending. As you mentioned, my name is Henry Oliver, and I'm the Communications International Programs Coordinator here at West Virginia University. So part of my job is to work with international students who are interested in coming to the United States and attending WVU. Uh, my presentation today is going to be talking about STEM programs in the United States. Now, I'm going to talk about undergraduate programs as well as graduate programs. And I'm going to focus not necessarily on West Virginia University, but on the programs as a whole. Um, you know, West Virginia University is what I tend to know well, so I will use this a lot as an example. Um, also, if you have any questions, please, at the end of the presentation, I look forward to being able to answer any of the questions you have. So, let's go ahead and get started. So, first off, what is STEM? STEM education is a really interesting concept that's truly becoming incredibly popular in the United States. And STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. Now, the U.S. has historically not necessarily um, excelled in these areas when it comes to its own secondary and primary education, but our higher education in these fields has always been top notch. So you really have to wonder why is STEM so important? And some of those reasons are STEM is a means of innovation. In today's society, you know, we reached almost a technology plateau, so we're always looking for ways to innovate in unique and interesting ways to help solve and address today's problems. Whether, whether it's water crises or natural resources or energy, STEM is the future, and STEM is the way that we're going to solve those problems. And that helps us build a better future by working on clean energy technologies, clean water, um, energy efficiency. STEM is what helps us do that. STEM fields help us meet a growing job market. There are tons of well-paying jobs in the fields of STEM. And through STEM education, both undergraduate and graduate, we can help prepare uh, young workers to meet these careers. It helps you gain essential skills. By studying in the US, you can gain these essential skills that you're needing for a job. Whether it's engineering, you can have the practical training and the practical implementation that you need to be a success. Or whether you're doing a, a physical science, like chemistry or biology, you can have the hands-on experience that you need to work in the job market. So STEM is providing the solution to today's problems. And our hope in the United States as higher education institutions is that we can train the next generation of scientists, engineers, mathematicians to be, to be equipped to address and help the world for those. 
So some facts about STEM education. It's important for many different disciplines. People who go into engineering don't always just work for an engineering firm. Those jobs are important not only in engineering or in, the, or in a, a research company, but they're also important in businesses. Businesses hire people like mathematicians, technologists, people working on networking. Um, those are incredibly important. Also, they're really important for government resources. The government of, of most countries around the world are employing these scientists to help, help with their own projects and their own means. So more than 50% of engineering doctorate degrees awarded in the U.S. are to non-U.S. citizens. I think this is a really interesting and fantastic statistic. It means that the U.S. is open to bringing in people from around the world for our education. Um, you know, we really truly feel that we excel in higher education and that we're willing and open to bringing in people to get that education so they can either stay in the U.S. and help us, you know, we definitely need help wherever we can get it, or they can return home and apply that education to their own uh, to their own background. So the demand for STEM professions is expected to increase at a four times greater rate than other fields. That's talking about uh, teaching degrees even, regular teaching degrees or the humanities or anything like that. STEM is increasing at a dramatic rate. So STEM professions are also some of the best paying and most highly sought. So we know how you know, STEM is a great means of, of innovating and a great means of providing pro uh, solutions to today's problems. But there's also the benefit that STEM jobs tend to be well-paying, secure careers, which is another benefit. So talking more about careers in STEM, you know, as I mentioned, they are traditionally very well-paying. These jobs are, um, you know, you're working for engineering firms, you're highly sought, you hold a valuable skill that people need. They're also secure professions. It's safe to assume that these jobs are going to be needed and, and very valued far into the future. They require a lot of technical skills. And that's why you know, the education is incredibly important, is because it gives you that hands-on experience. You know, a lot of the US educational system focuses on laboratory experience, where you're actually getting hands-on work with what you're trying to study. Uh, the degree is very important. You know, having that degree, whether it be a bachelor's, whether it be a master's, or whether, whether it be a doctorate, that's really looked at uh, by employers, and they'll want that degree. Um, opportunities for promotion are really abundant in STEM careers. So it's a career that can truly last through your lifetime. Um, you know, they're also the fastest growing careers. And something that I find really important is that they're rewarding and challenging. It's really great to be able to go into work every day and be challenged and to have to actually work and have to actually um, strive to make things better. And I think that that's a really unique opportunity in STEM. So here we have some of the sample careers that people enter in the STEM fields. People can go into medicine, engineering, information technology, often looked over agricultural science, which we find incredibly important, especially here at West Virginia University, um, web development, a STEM teacher, architect, research and mathematics. So these are all some of the careers. And over here from the Department of Education, I have um, the percentage increase for STEM jobs over the past, uh, for, from 2010 to the next four years. <coughs> so you see about 14% is the expected job increase for most professions. And then for all the way up to biomedical engineers, it goes to 62%. So to answer your question real quick, Vishwa, uh, the pro this will last about probably 10 or 15 more minutes, and then we'll have a question and answer session. So to talk a little bit about STEM programs in the United States, which is why you are all here. Um, STEM programs in the US are some of the most highly ranked programs in the world. Now, I'm talking about looking beyond necessarily an institution's ranking. You can look at the programmatic rankings of these institutions. So if you're looking at engineering disciplines, chemistry, physics, agriculture, these programs are really heavily dominated in the United States. Um, these are respected reputations with these institutions. When you get a degree from these institutions, it's recognizable, and people know that it's a quality education. One of the benefits of doing these programs in the United States is our quality of instructors. Um, our doctoral students in the United States or, or abroad come to higher education institutions in the US to teach. So we really have some of the best quality instructors that you can find. Quality facilities is another benefit. Um, as I'm sure you all are aware, education in the US is not necessarily inexpensive, but there's a lot of rewards and benefits that come from that. 
some of the facilities that we have are the best in the world. We have laboratory equipment that rivals a lot of corporations um, that do these things professionally. We have the best facilities for our students, the best opportunities, the best labs, and that's what helps set the U.S. education apart. Um, another benefit of studying in the U.S. is the fact that it is a well-rounded liberal arts education at its base. That means that you're not only going to be taking courses in your discipline, you're not only going to be taking maths and science, physics, and chemistry, you're going to be also required to take some courses in the liberal arts and humanities. So you're going to need a basis for things like sociology or psychology or um, humanities and arts or foreign language. So all of these are a big part of the U.S. education. And it's one of the things that adds value to it. It's also, for you all especially, it's an incredible cultural experience. Having the experience of living abroad and living in the United States increases your value as a graduate. When you can return home, people understand that you have that experience. You have the English skills. You have, you have the experience of working with people in the U.S. And that makes you really valuable to prospective employers. It's the same thing that we say to U.S. students who want to study abroad. And it's true. It increases your value. Um, and employers look at it very favorably. Extracurricular activities are another amazing part of uh, education programs in the U.S. Um, we have a lot of, especially in our College of Engineering, there's a lot of extracurriculars that are educational that you can participate in. For example, um, there's competitions that are done with other universities across the U.S. For example, we do a solar house. So this is where our students work together to design a solar efficient house. Um, and then they have to build it here in Morgantown. They disassemble it, and then they take it to Washington, D.C., and it gets judged in competition with other schools from around the country. There are some competitions where we make canoes out of, uh, or little boats out of concrete, something very counterintuitive. Um, we make fuel-efficient vehicles. So there's a lot of competitions and extracurricular activities in the STEM field that can help you later on, because it's, it's giving you more interaction with your peers, and it's also giving you a better relationship with your faculty. Um, the other big thing is services and support. U.S. institutions are known for having a lot of services and a lot of support systems in place. So one of the things you can benefit from are those. Um, these can include tutoring or assistance workshops, and I'll go into more details about those in a minute. So yeah, so some of the resources that we have for success. Tutoring resources are incredibly important. Um, you know, if you're going into engineering, for example, I know you have to have up to four levels of calculus, and that can be difficult and challenging. Or even if you're having trouble with chemistry or physics, most U.S. institutions have tutoring services available at no cost to you. So these are available for all students to be able to participate in, and those can help you um, understand or if you're struggling in a subject. We even have writing workshops for international students. We have um, English as a second language workshops. So if you're having trouble with some of the language comprehension, you can work with faculty who will help you with research writing or anything like that. Math workshops are incredibly important. Um, in the US especially, students tend to struggle with mathematics. So the universities, WVU especially, I know we have this, have a lot of math workshops to help students who may be having struggle, uh, troubles with math. Office hours are another great resource for students. Faculty are required to keep office hours, which is basically they are in their office with an open door. And if you have any questions or problems with the material, you're more than welcome to come and talk to the faculty and have them explain it to you better. And it's a great resource. Not many students take advantage of it, but it also allows you to build a relationship with your faculty. Um, and this applies for both undergraduates and graduate students. Graduate students more so because you're going to be required to work closer with a faculty for a lot of your research or your thesis. Um, student success services. These are sort of counseling services that most universities have. Um, these are where you work with students. Uh, you, you work with either peer success coaches or professional success coaches that will help sort of drive you towards, towards your end goals. They'll help you figure out what the best resource strategies are for you studying uh, strategies, and they'll be able to help you figure out sort of what your end goal is and how to meet it. Clubs and intramurals are another great benefit. Um, West Virginia University, for example, has over 400 student clubs and organizations. These can range anywhere. We have the International Student Organization, the Indian Student Association. We have a swing dance club. If you're Harry Potter fans, we have a Quidditch team. So these are all 
uh, fun activities and a great way to meet friends, but we also have a lot of intramural sports. So a lot of U.S. institutions have very large sports and athletics programs that require a lot of time from the students. And not every student can do that. But we have a lot of intramurals, which are also known as club sports, which are basically a less formal sports team. And you still compete against other schools in the area. Um, and our soccer intramural is a really great time. Everyone loves it. Recreation facilities are another great resource. We really value physical education uh, and physical fitness, as well as your intellectual well-being. And so most universities, WVU especially, ours is enormous. We have recreation facilities with workout equipment, basketball courts, squash courts, tennis courts, um, Olympic-sized swimming pools, tracks, everything. Everything to help you stay as fit as possible. And then career services are another incredibly important piece. So once you actually go through the education, we also want you to be able to find the best job you can. And these are career services that can also help our international students, especially with OPT. Um, you'll be able to you'll be able to work with our career counselors, and they can help you find a job. They'll help you with resume writing, cover letter writing, interview skills, and they also host career fairs where they bring people in, job uh, pe uh, employers to to evaluate and work with you. So studying in the U.S., some of the facts. So there are nine hundred and uh, seventy-four thousand nine hundred and twenty-six international students in the U.S. That's 4.8% of the U.S.'s total uh, college student. 44% of those students are in the STEM field. India is the second largest international student population with 132,000 students. So there's many different types of universities in the U.S. So we have, you can go to um, community colleges, which often offer associate's degrees. There's um, small four-year colleges or liberal arts colleges. And then there are schools like my school, West Virginia University. We're a large public land-grant university. Uh, we're fully comprehensive, which means we offer almost every major there is. Um, and these are where you get a really well-rounded education. Each has their own value. I, of course, am personally fond of the large public land-grant, but that's just me. But so there are many different types of universities in the US. But it's important that you do the research and work with your Education USA counselors to find the one that's going to be best for you. Um, so there's many different types of majors. So even if you're interested in STEM, there's still a lot of different things you can study. You can study resource economics to biomedical engineering, petroleum engineering, biometric systems, forensic sciences. There's a lot of different majors. So it's important that you do the research to find what's going to be the best fit for you in the long run. So studying in the US and some ways that you can prepare for that. So different schools have different requirements. And this is something that I really can't stress enough. Every school is going to be different. So what it's important for you to do is it's important for you to look at the schools and see what their requirements are before you're ready to apply, because each one is different. Standardized tests are something that is also very important, the SAT. Um, some schools will require an SAT for admission, and some schools don't. WVU, for example, we do not require an SAT. Um, it can help you if you've taken the SAT. We encourage you to give us that score because we can definitely use that for your benefit, but it's not a requirement. Now, your quote-unquote high school grades or your secondary school grades, these are going to be the most important piece of most applications. So it's important that you have the ability to get us at the universities copies of these grades. Um, you know, sometimes it may be in a format that's not familiar to our admissions counselors, but there's some services that we can work with, and most schools do work with, that can help that make a bit more sense. So some of the other requirements, which we'll go over uh, in a few slides, you can have things like personal statements or letters of recommendation. All of these can also be re required. Um, one of the things that I also really encourage you to do is to look at the funding opportunities available at different schools. Different schools offer different scholarships. And so it's really important that you ask those questions to find out what scholarships are available and what funding opportunities are available. Um, TOEFL or IELTS. So this is another really important piece. Most all these US institutions are going to have a TOEFL requirement for the most part. Not everyone will, but I, most everyone will. Now, most schools either accept the TOEFL or the IELTS. So it's really important that you do the preparation and you have the English language skills um, and you have your TOEFL ready. But if not, there's some things that you can do that we'll go over in a few minutes. But the, one of the most important things I can stress when you're preparing for education in the United States is to ask questions. 
Don't be afraid to ask questions. That's why people like me are here to answer those questions and help make it as easy of a process as possible. So the application process. Now I'm gonna base this on how we do it at West Virginia University, of course, because that's what I know best. So the common application is a really great resource and we do accept it here at WVU. The common application allows you to fill out one application and use that to apply to multiple universities across the US. Um, so you only do all the hard work once and then you can easily submit your application to different institutions across the US. A lot of schools also have the opportunity for you to apply online. An online application is incredibly easy. It allows you to upload everything you need. You may still have to mail some stuff, but all the vital information in getting the application started can be done quickly and simply. Letters of recommendation. These are often required by US institutions. So these are basically gonna to need to come from a faculty member you've worked with already for graduate students, or if you're coming in as an undergraduate, you can work with your high school's guidance counselors or, or, or a teacher that you've become close with and can speak well to your skills and abilities. A personal statement is also something that is typically going to be required. Sometimes they'll require a personal statement that will basically, they'll give you a prompt that'll ask you um, for a couple different, it'll, it'll ask you to assess your writing skills, but it'll also look to see how well you can metacognitively and analyze a situation and sort of explore your own perceptions of something. But the personal statement, don't dread it. It's not that big of a deal and it's not that bad. So having your documentation in order is another important piece. So we want to make sure that when you're applying that you already have your TOEFL done. Even if your TOEFL is not the score that's needed for acceptance, have it ready. Have your high school transcripts ready to send. If you have taken the ACT or SAT, have those scores ready to send. But having your, your admission in, or having your documentation in place is incredibly important. That'll help the process move more quickly and it'll help benefit you. Um, Conditional admission. This is important for people who haven't got the English levels uh, that they need yet. So WVU and a lot of other institutions offer conditional admission, which is basically saying you are admitted to the university upon completion or scoring better on your TOEFL or IELTS or completing an intensive English program. So that's going to be really valuable and important to know. Also, if, if your high schools offer AP or CLEP or IB courses, it's important to also have that documentation in place because it's a really great benefit to you to be able to have access to getting scores for your AP and getting college credit while you're in high school. Another important thing is to pay attention to deadlines. Deadlines are very important and one of the things we don't ever want to do is have to turn someone away because they've applied too late. So I can always encourage you, it is always best to apply early. This goes for graduate, this goes for undergraduate. And it's really important for graduate students because your application deadlines tend to be much earlier. For example, WVU continues to accept international undergraduate applications. Our hard deadline is April 1st, but we're technically still accepting undergraduate applications. However, for most graduate programs, the deadline was in January, and it's sort of a hard deadline. There's not a lot of flexibility with it. The other thing to talk about is credential evaluation. Um, if you think that your transcripts are not in English, you're going to have to unfortunately have those evaluated and transposed into English. But there's a lot of services and a lot of way, great ways to help you do that. And I'm sure your advisors with EdUSA can speak to that a lot better than I can. So here I have some screenshots of what our application process looks like here at WVU. Really simply, how to apply as an international student. So you review the admissions requirements, the English proficiency requirements, and the application deadlines. So right there, you can apply online, you can do the printable application. If you don't have access to do it online or can't complete the full application online, you also have the option to do a printed application. Then you can do the Common App as well. So once again, your English language is really important there. And then we ask you to send us the documentation. So here we have um, some information for first year students, which are just the minimum requirements. So a 2.5 GPA, which is about a C plus average or a B minus. You could technically equivocate it either way, I think. We have some information for transfer students, and we also have our English language requirements. Now, most universities are going to have a page like this. So that'll help you to be able to find that, and you can decipher the information that you need and sort of see what you'll need to finish. Um, and I wanted to touch a little more on the AP or the IB equivalencies and the Cambridge International Certificates, O-levels, A-levels. 
WVU accepts all of those, most institutions do, and you can access any of the information you'll need for those right there. Now the application process for graduates. I know that this looks very, there's not a whole lot of information here, and there's a reason for that. And that's the first bullet point, is that for graduate students, you apply to the department. Every department is different. At WVU, we have 193 different degree programs. So each one of those has the ability to make their own decisions and their own requirements on graduate admission. Um, a student is still required to apply to the university's graduate office, which is sort of a small paper application. But then you also submit a lot of your materials and a lot of your documentation directly to the department. So the department has the discretion to make the decision. For undergraduates, it's centralized. Our admissions office can make those decisions. But for graduate, it's very decentralized and is within the department. Now for STEM majors, they may require, you know, they're definitely going to require a GRE or they're going to require an MCAT or a PCAT or one of the standardized tests that works for that. Um, you know, especially with professional programs like, like any type of medical program, those are, you're going to have to look at the specific requirements from the department because there is no one answer that fits all of those. Um, something, though, that's very important to talk about with graduate students and prospective graduates is graduate assistantships. Graduate assistantships are an amazing way to come and study in the U.S. What you can do with those is it basically gives you the opportunity to study at no cost to you and you get paid to do so. Um, WVU has a lot of graduate assistant opportunities. They're very common, especially in the STEM disciplines, in engineering and in physics or chemistry or biology, um, agriculture. These graduate assistantships are very important because you'll come and you'll work typically 20 hours a week. You'll work for a faculty member, uh, whether that be, or, or an office. You can work as a service assistant, a research assistant, a teaching assistant, um, and then the university actually pays you to do that. And then you can also, um, oh, I'm sorry, I got distracted by the, I saw a question come in. Um, so the university will actually pay you to do that and give you a full tuition waiver in most cases. So that's incredibly important, but that's also one of the reasons that you want to apply early is because to be considered for those, you have to have your application in on time. And typically those are going to be in January. So you just want to have everything ready at that point. Um, we can also offer conditional admission for graduate applications. So you can enter the intensive English program if your English skills aren't high enough. And then once you successfully complete that, you can matriculate into the regular university. Now to talk a little bit about master's versus PhD, um, master's are a really great professional degree. They're, uh, for engineering, have traditionally been thought of as, as the best, the highest level of professional. Um, you know, PhD tends to be more research focused or working in a university. Um, and so if you hold on one second, we'll get your questions at the end. I don't want to miss out on your question. So if you just hold on a couple more minutes. Um, a lot of WVU's programs and a lot of programs around the country are switching out of master's programs, specifically in the hard sciences. For example, WVU no longer offers a master's in chemistry or master's in physics. These are solely doctorate level programs. Um, and the reason for that is because they just believe that the PhD is the best opportunity for the degree. Now, engineering masters are still very common because that is considered the professional degree. Uh, that is what you would go into if you wanted to sort of reach the higher echelons of practical work. A PhD may still be reserved for folks who want to work in research or at a university, but that's not even necessarily the case. So once you're accepted, you get your letter of admission. You'll hear a lot from our international student services. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of visa details with you. I know that EdUSA has a visa webinar coming up, and I really recommend you do that. Um, I am not a visa expert by any means, but so you're but I can tell you that your International Student Services Office will help you with the visa process on the university end. They'll give you the necessary documentation or ask you for the necessary documentation to issue your I-20 so that you can come. Um, so once you have that taken care of, you need to confirm your attendance. So you confirm your attendance to the university, let them know you're coming. Some things you want to consider before you come, housing, insurance, dining, things like that, and student life. But that's why you have um, <laughs> that's why you have these international student services offices available as a resource to you. What you're going to have is you're going to have the ability 
uh, to use them as sort of counselors, and they'll help you adjust to the acclimation of moving to the U.S. and being able to, to help you with any of the problems that you have or help you uh, make sure that everything is taken care of when you arrive. So lastly, I wanted to give you some links and credits and resources for you to use. So if you're interested in STEM education, the stemedcoalition.org, great website, Institute for International Education, Education USA's website, um, and the Dep U.S. Department of Education STEM website. Also, you have my contact information down here. Once again, my name is Henry Oliver. I'm with West Virginia University. Um, and my email address is right there. So if you have any questions about anything, please don't hesitate to contact me. I'm happy to answer. If you have, want any more information on West Virginia University, I can gladly give that to you. Now, I think we can go ahead and open it up. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Oliver. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Uh, students, I'd, yeah, I'd like you to now type in your questions, and uh, I will you know, pull them up onto the screen, and um, Oliver will um, you know, take one by one, take them one by one, and answer your questions. So I'm just pulling up this first question that we had earlier. OK, so could you share some insights about the maybe the CPT and OPT, Oliver, uh, curricular practical training and optional practical training? Absolutely. So what OPT is, OPT is an employment benefit for international F1 visa students to work in the United States in a job related field to your study. So its purpose is to help enhance and supplement your classroom education. Um, citizenship services uh, adjudicates and authors, uh, authorizes OPT. So um, to be eligible for OPT, okay, let me let me think here. I don't I don't do a lot with OPT, so I'm trying to just think of the best way I can think to put it. So basically, you apply for your OPT um, about 90 days prior to the end date of your program, between 90 and 60 days. So you have to have completed everything for your program. But I know that the U.S. has recently also extended OPT opportunities for STEM fields. Now, what those are exactly right now, I don't want to say because I don't want to give yeah. you wrong information. But I can tell you that there are oh, a lot of OPT opportunities that. available. Yeah, just uh, for MS students who are on the STEM program, uh, they're all students are eligible for 12 months, uh, plus they can get an extension of 24 months. Uh, that's what we at Education USA have heard recently. Uh, yeah, that's, I, I thought they had extended okay, so it, but I wasn't 100% what the time frame was. Right, right, yes. It's uh, 12 plus 24 months extension. Okay, let's go on to the next question. Okay. Those are typically paid. Right. Yeah. Is TOEFL a necessity for U.S. citizens residing abroad? That's your next question. Okay. That's a great question. I can answer that specifically for WVU. Now, other institutions may vary. For a U.S. Uh, citizen residing abroad, a TOEFL will not be required. But what, what you will have to do then is submit an SAT score. Because if you're living abroad, you have two options. You can apply as a U.S. citizen or as an international student. If you apply as a U.S. citizen, you don't need the TOEFL, but what you will need then is to be sure and have an SAT or an ACT score that you will have to submit. But if you're applying as an international student, we don't require an SAT or an ACT. So I have a question, question related to this, uh, Henry. If, uh, what about um, in-state tuition versus out-of-state tuition for in, you know, citizens who are U.S. citizens who are living in India, for example, if they are applying? As American citizens, sure. if they're going to apply to a university, would they be eligible for in-state tuition? Or would they be considered um, as international would. students? So they will be considered international students. Yeah. So we're a state university. So um, we have an in-state tuition that is only eligible for West Virginia residents. So this includes okay. students in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is literally five minute drive up the road. Those students have to pay the same tuition as international students. It's, it's all one tuition. Okay. Or out of okay. state. Okay. If my GPA is less than 2.75, but I have achieved postgraduate diploma with a three GPA, is that accepted? So for a graduate course, what I will always recommend is to defer to the graduate department. Um, the admissions department, if a graduate department thinks the student will succeed, then the admissions department will typically follow suit and allow them access into the program. Um, they may give you sort of a conditional admission that may say, okay, well, you know, you have to successfully complete several courses and, and, and that's fine. 
Um, but if, if your other scores are strong and if you feel like your GRE is good, then I really recommend you go ahead and apply or at least reach out to the department. Because, you know, once again, with graduates, every single course, you know, they hold the discretion for those graduate programs. So when you when this person, uh, Allah just asked for the graduate department's email, which graduate department are you speaking of? So Allah, you will have to write to the specific department and have your query answered. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll type Can you give me a little insight? Yeah. Oh, a little insight. Okay, so the next question. Major. Yeah, gladly. So computer science at WVU goes all the way up to a doctoral program. So we have a bachelor's, a master's, or a doctorate. It's located, it's housed in our College of Engineering and Mineral Resources. So students basically work with coding and learning a lot of different coding languages and um, computer, computer networking technologies and things along that line. So the difference I usually tell students between computer science and computer engineering is computer science tends to deal with software issues, you know, a little more about the, the user interface. Computer engineering is more hardware based, um, but it, it's a fantastic program. What is the good new SAT score for the Ivy League colleges and West Virginia University for the computer science program? <laughs> well, I, I can't tell you about the Ivy Leagues. I, I just don't know, to be honest with you. Um, now I can tell you that for WVU, once again, we don't require an SAT score for admission. But if you are applying with an SAT score, um, I honestly haven't seen the statistics for the new SAT. Um, but it can help you out when it comes to direct admittance into your college. So it's something that if you're interested in doing, by all means, submit your SAT scores. It never hurts. Can we apply for two or more programs from within one university? More programs. Yes, absolutely. Um, specifically for graduate programs, absolutely. So when you're, if you're applying for an undergraduate, you're just applying as an undergraduate student, and then you declare your major. If you're applying for graduate, you can apply for multiple programs. That's not a problem. But you would probably need to fill out the department. You would need to send the resources to each department respectively. So say you were applying to computer science and computer engineering, you would need to send all your information to computer science. You would need to send it separately to computer engineering. The next question is, what is the difference between co-ops and internships? OK, so an internship. The difference is a co-op tends to actually be longer. Co-ops tend to last a full semester. Um, you also are a little more integrated as an employee in a co-op. Typically, co-ops are paid. Typically, they're very well paid um, for engineering students. The difference in an internship would be that it's more job shadowing. You're not necessarily getting a paid situation. They're typically shorter, probably over the summer. Um, and it's mostly an observation style. Uh, uh, work experience as opposed to a co-op, which will be a more hands-on work experience. Fall is always a better admit. <laughs> internship, Are internship opportunities available at WVU, and uh, this is a student who's doing his undergraduate degree in computer science and engineering in India at the moment. Sure. Yeah, there's always the opportunity to do an internship. Now, what I recommend is that you try and look on um, our, our, our computer science program's website, which if you just Google WVU computer science, it'll be the first thing that comes up. So now the computer science program, what you'll need to do is you'll need to go through the faculty page and sort of find a faculty who, who sort of has a similar research interest or a shared interest to what you're studying. Once you find them, just don't hesitate. Send them an email and ask them if they would be willing to take an intern. Um, my office can help you handle the visa part of it, but the, the faculty themselves will have to help you with the internship piece. Financial aid and scholarships for international students. Absolutely. So WVU does provide um, scholarships for international students. Unfortunately, federal financial aid, there, it's not possible for an international student to qualify for. We do have some emergency assistance uh, funds that we have access to, but we do also offer scholarships. And our scholarships are based solely on your high school GPA. And this is for undergrad. Um, so for the high school GPA, if you have above a 3.0 US equivalent, which is a B average, we can offer you $5,000 a year. 
Uh, if you have above a 3.25, we can offer 6,000. And if you have above a 3.5 GPA, we can offer you $7,000 a year. Now for graduate students, there's not traditionally as much scholarship available, but you're typically doing those graduate assistantships, which are very, very well paying, great opportunities, and they're fairly abundant. So for a work study program, um, your visa actually restricts the amount of time you can work in the US, unfortunately. So you can study at WVU. You do have to be enrolled as a full-time student, which is 12 US credit hours. But your visa will allow you to work on campus 20 hours a week. And so we do have a lot of student employment opportunities available at WVU. So now there's not really a work study balance program or anything like that, unfortunately. It's either you know you have to be enrolled full time, but there is still work opportunities available. Is MS compulsory to pursue a PhD in computer science and are funding opportunities available? So for computer science, I'm not, I don't believe that the, P, the, the MS is compulsory. I believe that you can apply directly into the PhD, though most students will do an MS PhD tract, which will last between five and six years. Um, funding opportunities for that, once again, unless you have some sort of outside scholarship or you have some sort of government assistance, the, the funding opportunities would be sort of limited to a graduate assistantship. But I don't really think you should ever think of a graduate assistantship as work. Um, you should think of it as a great opportunity to help build your resume because not only is the university waiving your tuition and they're giving you a large stipend per year, what they're also giving you is the opportunity to say, oh, well, you know, I assisted with this research project or I have this work and professional experience already or I did this teaching assistantship. So, you know, the, the graduate uh, assistantships are fantastic programs. An F-1 visa and the student visa are the same thing. Um, so actually, the international student financial aid application? Yeah, for that, I'm, yeah. I'm trying to, I, I honestly, I don't, I've never heard of it. So I really The international can't. student, it's something like, like some students fill out the CSS profile, and some universities require the international student financial aid application form. Different schools seem to accept different uh, forms that students need to fill out to apply for financial aid. So in the case of West Virginia University, what would be the form that students would have to fill out to seek financial aid? To seek financial aid. Well, what you would do is I feel like most of our international students, if they're seeking financial aid, find it through private loan agencies, in which case you would work with our financial aid office. Um, and I wish I had a better answer to that question, but if you email me that question, I will find the answer for you. Um, unfortunately, I don't know that one off the top of my head. I haven't had experience with that, but I can find out for you. Okay. I'm happy to do that. Okay. So when, when I, you can make note of Henry's email uh, ID, which is here on the screen, and do email him and he'll be able to find that out and respond to you later. Right. Okay. Okay, so do you offer a dual degree BS MS program for the computer science major? I don't know. We actually don't offer a dual degree, but our students, uh, you can often come into the BA, or the, I'm sorry, the BS, and then often go directly into the MS. It's not too big of a problem, but it isn't a, a, a direct admission five year degree, no. Okay, I think related to that point, which the student is, is it the student or student? Okay, so the next question. This, uh, okay, this is a very specific individual question I see. Uh, Akshay, could you email Henry? Because it's, um, unless you would like to take this, Henry. No, I think email me is going to be the best case for this one. And what I'll do is I'll get you in yeah. contact directly with the graduate department and we'll try and figure out what we can do. There was a question earlier about contact details for the graduate department, and uh, Henry has shared the email for the graduate uh, programs department. Do make a note yeah, of that's this. That's for graduate engineering. Yeah. 
Now, um, yeah. if you have in engineering and computer science, that's it. If you're interested in a different field like biology or chemistry or something else, I can definitely get you in contact with them as well. But uh, most of the questions were for engineering, so I went ahead and put that up there. Um, I just saw a pre-med curriculum. Yes, WV offers a pre-med curriculum. We have a pre-med in biology, a pre-med in biochemistry, a pre-med in chemistry, and a pre-med in exercise physiology. So we have four different tracks that a student can do. So the SAT scores can help for scholarships at some institutions. WVU, though, we base it solely on your high school GPA. Um, and our philosophy behind that is, if English isn't your first language, then I can't truly look at your SAT score and think that that is the best reflection of your skills. I think that the test is not really, and I mean, that's just our personal philosophy, and everyone's different. So our scholarships are based solely on the high school GPA, but a lot of institutions do factor in the SAT. Um, it just varies per student and or per institution. And yeah, we do offer the scholarships $5,000, $6,000, or $7,000 per year, depending on the high school GPA. Yeah, you can apply as an undecided major. That's not a problem at all. Um, a lot of students enter undeclared. And we actually have a really great advising and support system called our university college that helps students who are undecided. Um, there's a lot of of support they have there in career guidance to help you figure out what exactly you do want to major in based on your career goals and your long-term goals. Yes, for, those, for assistantships, scholarships, fellowships, the department that you're applying to is going to have the information on that because, once again, it's very decentralized for graduate. Every department can have their own funding sources, their own assistantships, and their own fellowships. Next question. I would definitely say fall. I think that the U.S. educational system definitely is geared towards a fall start. You know, a spring start is definitely possible, and even a summer start is possible. Um, you know, if you can't make it for the fall, don't hesitate to do the spring. It's not a bad thing by any means, but I just think, you know, starting in the fall, that's when most students traditionally start in the U.S., um, and I think it's good to be part of that cohort. It's good for your student life. It's good for your, your, you know, your outside of the classroom experience. So, but, it, but you know, it, not one is truly better than the other for any academic reason. Uh, just adding to that question, uh, Henry, uh, would it make a difference whether, you know, to your scholarships or your assistantships in terms of when you join the university, whether it was spring admit or a fall it, admit, would it matter? You know, in, it can. Um, I would say that most students do start in the fall. So if you're not starting in the fall, if you're trying to start in the spring, the assistantships may not be as abundant because they may have already been taken by students right. starting in the fall. That would be, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, so that's something definitely okay. also to consider. <laughs> Oh, I wish I knew that. I'm sorry. I don't. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question. But once again, if you email me, I know the people who do know the answers to this thing. Um, I, we, we said that it's about 36 months, correct, with the OPT, if yeah. you apply for the extension and are accepted into it after the 12 months. No, the, the institutional scholarship doesn't qualify you for in-state tuition. In-state tuition is only for West Virginia residents. And unfortunately, being a student does not qualify you for residency. So. So as, as far as your GPA would be calculated, our admissions team would do that. And I know that Education USA may offer some more insight and resources for this. But an 85% score would typically be around, like, I would say 3.3, probably 3.2. Um, so it, it, would, it would be above a 3.0 for sure. MOOCs, that's a good question. So a, a massively open um, uh, course. Online courses. Yeah, so they're, open online they're, not, necessarily, they're not really graded. At least at WVU, we don't grade MOOCs. 
um, and we really can't consider them for undergraduate admission or, or, or as curriculum and coursework. Now, what a MOOC can do is it can help with your your CV or your resume. You know, you can put that on there, and that can help. But that's just going to be based on the discretion of the person evaluating your credentials um, and your CV for your graduate acceptance. Yeah, this is related I think, question. You know, yeah, I don't think it hurts to put it on there. However, I don't think a MOOC can really hold any official capacity for you. Um, but what it does show is that it shows that you're taking initiative and you're putting out interest into these disciplines. So it definitely doesn't hurt to put it on there. That's a good question. So if you complete your four-year degree, um, it's a BS at WVU in engineering. Unfortunately, if you're an international student, the TOEFL is always required, at least at WVU. Other schools may not have that, but um, unfortunately, WVU will require it. And, and this is a battle that I am constantly fighting with my admissions team. I say, you know, if someone's doing their high school education in English, I don't really think they need to take an English proficiency test. However, they haven't let me make all the decisions yet. so. Okay, this is a student who is an American citizen and has been residing in India for a few years. So he's wondering that if you were going to accept him as an out-of-state um, student, will he be considered in-state after completing one year of uh, residency in the U.S.? No, because once again, your residence in-state and at West Virginia University is only for West Virginia residents. So you would have to live in West Virginia for two or three years without being in school to qualify as a resident of West Virginia and in-state tuition. So he, the student would have to live in West Virginia for at least how many years to establish residency? Uh, more than one year. Pro I think it's over two years. Okay. For, for educational purposes. Um, yeah. So yeah, if you're a so US citizen living in, yeah, you're definitely eligible for scholarships. So if you choose to apply as a U.S. citizen, your, your scholarships will be evaluated with an SAT score. Now, if you choose to apply, um, but the other benefit to doing that is as a U.S. citizen, you're eligible to complete the FAFSA, the free, the free application for federal student aid. Um, but if you do it that route, then you have to submit an SAT score. However, if you choose to apply as an international student, only your GPA will be taken into consideration for your scholarships, um, but you won't be eligible to complete a FAFSA. So it's sort of a catch-22 there. The best thing to do in a gap year, that's a very, um, that's a very subjective question. But as someone who also works in study abroad, I think that doing some sort of work abroad or some sort of international experience or some sort of service is going to be the best thing to help with a gap year. If you're working you know, at, a, at a nonprofit or helping a community or something like that, those are things that look really good on a gap year. The undergrad cost of attendance at WVU is around $21,000 a year just for tuition. So for housing and everything, housing meals, tuition fees, the whole thing, uh, the cost is around $32,000 a year. However, the, the scholarships can, you know, if your GPA is good, your scholarships, $5,000, $6,000, or $7,000, depending on that GPA, that can help knock a lot off that cost. Um, Henry, I have a question. For students who might be pursuing their undergraduate degree already in India and are looking to transfer to a university in the U.S., what would be the transfer policy at West Virginia University? Yeah, Did you so accept students course. after they complete one, one year of an undergraduate degree? So I actually, I think I have it on the slide. Okay, so here we have, um, it's actually incredibly hard to read, but so you have to have a 2.0 and a 4.0 scale. Uh, so you have to meet the English language proficiency and you have to have 24 transferable credit hours. So 24 is about one year under your belt to transfer over. Anything less than 24 credit hours, we're gonna consider you a first time applicant. And you can find that information is let me see if I can do this right. I'm not a great drawer, apparently. 
But so here's where we have a little bit of info on our transfer. Um, but if a student has any questions about transfers, uh, once again, don't hesitate to email me. If I can do nothing else for you, I can at least connect you to the people who can help you. Um, and our transfer team is fantastic. We actually do a lot with transfers. So we have a lot of students who transfer to WVU to finish their degree from uh, international institutions. See, so I'll throw my email back up there. Sports, I think, needs to know. Yeah, so sports are really favorably can, uh, looked at, I would definitely say. So for sports, um, you know, WVU is what, what is called Division One. So that means that our mm. sports teams are very competitive and they're very good. Um, so for admission, we look at sports as a good extracurricular, but our, our athletes are actually recruited. Um, for example, our football stadium holds 65,000 people. So it's, it's a very large facility. Sports are a very big thing. But if you want to continue with your sports, intramurals are a fantastic opportunity. No, physical, not, not physical sports, esports. So you're talking about like, um, like League of Legends and things like that. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I wish I could say they were looked at the same, but unfortunately, I don't think they are, at least not at this point. I think we're definitely getting there. Um, I have heard of a few U.S. universities that are, are having actually league teams. We do have a League of Legends club team. I know that, and I'm assuming we have the same thing for, for um, I'm not a super video game person, but I think Dota, <laughs> but I probably made myself silly there, but I'm not sure what these things are. So. Okay. Now the student says he's playing Dota, but obviously those things won't be taken into consideration right away in their admission process. No. Maybe in the future, but not right now. <laughs> okay. There was a question on the AP exam. Um, uh, okay. and is it something that you would look at when students are applying, or is it only to help them with waiving credits after they join the university? So. Um, an AP won't necessarily affect your admissions decision unless, you know, what an AP will do uh, is it's weighted differently on the GPA scale, so it can help increase your GPA. But once you've applied um, and been accepted, the, the AP credits will transfer and you'll get those credits. And on our international admissions page, there's actually a link there for AP exams. And so it'll give you the full AP list and it'll tell you based on your score and what exam you took, what courses you'll get. Uh, you know, we have students all the time that come in as sophomores because they're transferring so many AP credits. It's really interesting how that's changed um, in the past 10 years even. So if you get a scholarship, yeah, if you get a scholarship from WVU, one of our scholarships, those are good each year. So the scholarship, um, we, we sort of view tuition on an annual basis. So the tuition total, which is around $21,000 a year, if you get a $5,000 scholarship, that is $5,000 every year. Now, the stipulation to that would be if your grades drop and you don't meet standard academic satisfactory progress, then the scholarship would likely go away. But that's the case with every scholarship. All right. Thank you so much, students. I think we've had, um, unfortunately, the time is up for today's session. But uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us, students, and for all your questions. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, Henry for presenting and uh, answering students' questions so patiently. Oh, it's my uh, Henry's email ID is up here. Uh, students, for those of you who want more information about the university, please feel free to write to Henry, and he can always connect you to other people in the university, uh, the relevant uh, people in the university. Thank you so much, students, for joining us uh, this afternoon. Just uh, for your information, we, uh, we have um, another webinar for those of you who are interested in pursuing undergraduate education. Our next week's webinar is going to be about um, community colleges, a pathway to undergraduate education, and it will be presented by Butte College. So for those of you interested in undergraduate education, please do join us for the webinar on Friday, 20th of May. And finally, on 27th of May, we have uh, a webinar session on practical training options. We will be talking about the OPT and the CPT. This will be presented by one of our Education USA advisors from Delhi. So please join us for these webinars on the 20th of May and the 27th of May. And please do let your friends and students at your uh, school or colleges know about these webinars as well. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this afternoon. And thank you once again, Henry, for your presentation.
okay. and for presenting this session with us. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Students, just for your information, uh, the session is has been recorded and um, um, it will be, um, you know, put of the screen there is a link saying shared files you can log in in the same way as you've done today and um, by monday or tuesday this particular presentation for today's webinar will be up in our shared files section you can view the entire webinar once again um, and once it's archived on monday so do log in again if you want to go over this presentation please do log in and check uh, check it out the uh, presentations are also um, uploaded onto the Education USA India YouTube page. So do log in uh, to the Education USA India YouTube page, and most of our previously recorded webinars have been uploaded uh, for viewing in that space as well. So do check that space out as well. Thank you again, everybody, for joining us. Bye bye. Bye, Oliver. Thank you.